You're listening to Campaign 2012, a podcast from the Brookings Institution. Obama, as a candidate, really decided to make an issue out of Afghanistan, as in you, you focused on the wrong war, there was the good war over here. I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is that at this point, there is not an essentially partisan critique to be made. Is that right? Sort of, but I also think it's just four years later and we've tried one more strategy and it hasn't been a brilliant success. Uh -huh. Obama, you know, for Obama in 07 08, all the stars sort of aligned in the same set of directions. He needed to prove he wasn't just a sort of McGovern Democrat, to be a little flip, and with apologies to George McGovern, but nonetheless, who was seen as too weak on defense in the election against Nixon, or even Dukakis, for example. And so Obama needed to learn from those mistakes. So to some extent, he wanted to sound very tough vis-a-vis al-Qaeda and vis-a-vis -vis the Afghanistan war to make sure people did not interpret or misinterpret his opposition to the Iraq war as tantamount to being a, a lefty president. And so uh, also at that moment in time, the Bush administration really had under-resourced Afghanistan. And almost everyone agreed, or now agrees, that they, oh, those first five, six, seven years were a missed opportunity. Uh, whether we had to put 100,000 forces in Afghanistan at that point or not, we did need to at least build up an Afghan army, an Afghan police. We didn't. We minimized our commitment, and so Obama's critiques sounded plausible. And it had people like Bruce Rydell in full agreement, and increasingly myself as well and a lot of other people. But now we're four years later. We tried the muscular approach. It produced mediocre results. Let's call it a gentleman's C um, at best in terms of where Afghanistan and Pakistan are today relative to where we had hoped. And it's not all Obama's fault, but it's not a great success in policy. So what does that leave you? Um, you know, and he has killed a lot of al-Qaeda leaders with drones and commandos. So bottom line, how do you attack him on that front? You're probably better off looking for a different set of issues. And for the Republicans, they've got the economy. Right. And so you're describing a campaign in which this is a, a, a dominant foreign policy issue in governance, but not in campaigning, um, in which policy has failed and needs to be recalibrated, and in which the essential dynamics of the discussion are not especially partisan. So where does that leave a new administration coming in, whether it's a new Obama administration or a Mitt Romney administration or a Newt Gingrich administration? Um, what, is, what needs to happen starting next January in order to recalibrate this policy in a way that will be more effective than it has been over the last few years? Well, just to tick off a couple of things, and we try to get them in more detail in the paper, one big decision for the newly elected president, whoever he may be, is how fast do we draw down from the 68,000 troops that we're going to have by this fall. Now, President Obama may have by then decided to continue the drawdown. So by Election Day, we may be below 68,000. But if we stay there temporarily, the new president or newly elected president is going to have to make a decision. And presumably another policy review will be appropriate, a couple of three months long, at which point I think uh, we'll be into the 2013 fighting season. In Afghanistan, there's a lot more violence in the warm months because the insurgents often essentially camp out uh, and therefore fight a lot more uh, diligently during the warmer months than in the cold. And so by the time a policy review is completed, the natural thing would be to say uh, maybe let's uh, keep forces through September 2013 and then draw down from there. That would be one big set of questions, though. Do you do something like that? Also, in 2014, we're supposed to hand off complete nationwide responsibility for security to the Afghan army and police. In, in fact, we might accelerate it. Uh, Secretary Panetta was recently encouraging thinking along those lines in a trip to NATO. And so the question remains, what's the U.S. role after that transfer? Do we keep 10,000, 15, 20,000 forces to help do these special operations and drone strikes and help with intelligence and training? Or do we do what we did in Iraq and just leave? And, uh, or is there something in between? So that's a big set of issues. Then you've got to think about, okay, Karzai is supposed to step down in 2014. How are we going to help the Afghans make that transition, including how are we going to pressure Karzai to keep to his word and not what you might say is a sort of pulling a Putin? figuring out some way to stay in power even when he's constitutionally required to step down. That's a big set of issues. And finding the right set of incentives to Karzai and to other political actors in Afghanistan is going to be a big part of the agenda. And I think, you know, with Karzai, uh, one of the questions is can we find a way to uh, help create a UN position on relations between Islam and the West, some other thing that would be up to the 
dignity and the charisma that I think he really does possess and is capable of wielding in certain ways in that kind of a job, perhaps quite well, but to make sure he steps down from his current job, where Afghan democracy requires a transition. And then on Pakistan, I already mentioned shifting aid from the military towards the civilian sector, the civilian government is an important area. But we also, ironically, might want to think big. Most people are sick of working with Pakistan, but it may be the moment when you counterintuitively say to the Pakistanis, we can offer more, a free trade agreement, a big energy uh, sector initiative, if you will do a lot more by way of clamping down verifiably on the Haqqani network and on the Afghan Taliban that uses your territory for sanctuary and headquarters. Proposing that kind of a deal might be a long shot, but sometimes, uh, as Eisenhower used to say, when you've got an insoluble problem, enlarge it rather than making it smaller. Now, with Pakistan, um, you have a, a real tough love message, uh, or maybe just tough, no love. Um, you say very clearly that we have to stop thinking of Pakistan as an ally, or at least the Pakistani military as an ally, and we have to see our interest and the Pakistani military's interest as essentially hostile to one another. Um, how does that square with a big initiative that's sort of predicated on we'll do a lot more together. Um, and, and, you know, how realistic is it to think of this country in which we need to operate in some ongoing sense and fly our drones over as an essentially hostile territory um, with whom we are, I mean, you actually say something like containment, whom we're engaged in something like containment with? Yeah, uh, you're right that we use that kind of language, but I'm glad that you gave me the chance to explain because I don't think we can go so far as to treat Pakistan as a hostile state. If we do, we've lost the game in Afghanistan. I mean, if they are actually, in a declared way, working against us as a matter of comprehensive policy, we're in bad shape. Right now, they sort of work against us a third of the time, work with us a third of the time, and then look the other way a third of the time. And uh, what we have to do with Bruce Rydell's concept that I've, you know, agreed to as part of this paper, but Bruce is really the driving force behind this, is to basically say, you know, those proportions have shifted a little bit in the wrong direction the last couple of years. We've got to recalibrate our policy to try to push them back in the right direction. So it's more nuanced than, let's say, the, the title in Bruce's New York Times op-ed that got this whole ball rolling back in the fall would suggest. And Bruce basically talked about containment or the, uh, I should say, the op-ed page at the New York Times gave him a title that talked about containment and, you know, treating Pakistan virtually as a hostile place. In the paper, I think we're trying to strike a tone that's a bit more nuanced, to say, you know, we, we still want to give two, three billion a year in aid to Pakistan. So that's not exactly how you treat your enemies. But we want to shift that towards more of the civilian and economic sectors, less towards the military. Since money is fungible, Pakistan can always compensate by putting more of their budget into their military and letting us fund things they previously had to pay for themselves. And so it's not as if this puts them in a huge dilemma, but it sends a message that we need to shift our orientation a bit more towards the weak civilian government and tell the military, you know, we can take at least incremental steps that you may not like if you're going to do things that we don't like. And let's, let's rethink this before it goes too much further down this path. One last question. You talk in the paper about the importance of an institution-based government, not a person-based government in Afghanistan, which is one of the predicate reasons for your strong insistence that Karzai step down at the end of his term. Um, I know some readers will react to that as a reiteration of early 2001, 2002 era naivete about what's doable mm. in in Afghanistan realistically. And I'm, I'm curious for your thoughts on that. What, you know, this is a country that has lacked institution-based government for a very, very long time and which our prior efforts to build it have not availed much. And I, I guess I'm interested in why we should have any confidence that this time would or could or will be any different. Well, we're not looking for super results. You know, we would be happy with incremental progress. In other words, the Afghan parliament has sometimes showed some spine the last couple of years. They've refused a lot of Karzai's initial appointments after he was reelected president in 2009. That was to their credit. A little more of that kind of backbone we should encourage. 
There might be some small things that they can do in Afghanistan without revising the Constitution. For example, uh, right now, the Afghan parliament really has no research arm, like we have in the U.S. Congress with the Congressional Research Service, GAO, CBO. Maybe they should create one, and that would allow them to take more of a proactive lead on some key policy issues. There are things like that that can be done that are relatively small ball ideas that at least push in the right direction, because there is one big thing that we do need to accomplish by 2014, which is a successful transition of power. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, um, uh, you know, whether I'm naive or not about what's possible in Afghanistan, what I see coming is not pretty. Because what I see coming is a successor to Karzai being chosen in a country where personalities and patronage networks are the only game in the political arena. And therefore, it's a situation where you exacerbate tensions between ethnic groups, where you create clear winners and clear losers. And it's not about a vision for the country. It's about who gets access to the spoils. That's the political system that exists right now. And uh, Karzai, uh, whatever his strengths, and he has some, is presumably going to try to engineer a succession process where he has a lot of role in who's replacing him. And it's going to be based on who's loyal to him, who's loyal to his friends. We just got to try to at least shift that a little bit more towards a debate that involves some ideas. It doesn't have to be dominated by ideas. I'm not unrealistic in that sense. But if the election is about nothing but personality and patronage networks, we have a higher risk of a coup, a civil war, or Karzai inventing a reason to stay on. We just got to try to nudge the needle more towards substantive debate. And some of the ideas can be fairly straightforward. You know, there could be a part of the budget created to directly support some of the regional and provincial governments, for example. Wouldn't have to be a big shift, but it would allow a little bit of decentralization. That's the kind of idea they can debate in Afghanistan. They can debate whether they want us to stay after 2014 and with what size force. It would be good to see some substantive debate on that instead of having it just be what kind of a mood Karzai was in the night before when he negotiated with our representative be the determining you know, uh, factor in whether or not we get a deal. Just a little bit more substance, a little bit more policy, and a little more distribution of power. Uh, would be healthy. And the Afghans have pretty good instincts along these lines. So we have some raw material to work with. Thanks very much for coming in. My pleasure, Ben. Thank you. For more information about the paper discussed here or the Campaign 2012 project, please visit our website at www.brookings.edu slash projects slash campaign 2012.